Hi, this is Terry Cootie, founder and director of Deep Sea Foundation. Welcome to the Foundation educational channel where we talk about topics related to breast reconstruction. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Minas Krisopolo, who is out of PRMA in San Antonio, Texas. And he is a board certified and trained microsurgeon who specializes in using your own tissue, autologous breast reconstruction for breast cancer patients. He's also the developer of the free Breast Advocate app. And it is a decision tool for those who are affected by breast cancer. You can find more information at breastadvocateapp.com. <sighs> Welcome to the program, Dr. C. Good to see you again, Terry. It's good to see you too. I wanted to invite you today because I have a combined personal story, but of course, I always appreciate you um, educating the public about topics that we get inquiries about. So today we're going to talk about flap monitoring. Great topic. It is. And this, this of course, is exclusive to autologous tissue or deep flap. And so I want to make that clear to the viewers. Um, but I have to start out, I want to start out with just a little bit of a personal story, if I might. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you talked about was monitoring the flap. Now I know why he told me about that and why this is so important. And now I think it's one of the biggest concerns that women have um, mm -hmm. is flap failure. And they should be asking about the success rate that surgeons have. So that's my back end story. That's my personal story when the nurses would check it. So will you tell us about these flap monitoring systems, why we use them? I even have some slides that you shared that we mm -hmm. will share today and it will give us a little bit of an explanation. I'm done, yeah. you can take over now. So there are lots of different ways that we use different methods to make sure that the tissue that we transplant uh, is healthy, it's got a good blood supply and everything's looking good. So um, <clears throat> the monitoring that we do is typically for microsurgical techniques. So anything, any procedure that involves removing a piece of tissue from one part of the body, transplanting it and, and reconnecting the blood vessels so that blood flows in and blood flows out of your new breast. So the deep flap is the most common form of that tissue transplantation technique. But you can also take tissue from the thigh, from the buttocks, from wherever the patient has it to use. So obviously, if the blood flow stops, either going into the new tissue or coming out of the new tissue, then that's a problem and the tissue can die. So thankfully, uh, the risk of tissue dying in experienced hands is less than 1%. So the success rate of these microsurgical breast reconstruction procedures is very, very high. It's actually higher than implant reconstruction uh, if you're going to a center that specializes in these techniques. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to basically pick up a problem as soon as it arises. So when it comes to monitoring, you've got the old fashioned, just look, see, so clinical, mm -hmm. uh, make sure the color of the, of the breast looks okay, the tissue that's been moved up. Um, a lot of the times there's a small patch of skin that's showing that's attached to the, to the tissue that's been moved. So that kind of acts like a window. Mm -hmm. If the skin of the flap, so that the tissue that's moved is called the flap. Mm -hmm. So if the skin of the flap is visible from the outside and that looks okay, it tells us that the fat that's attached to the skin is also healthy. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned the T-STAT, which is our preferred device for monitoring, which is the next level up, and it's the highest level that we have right now. Um, and that's a perfusion monitor. So it has a little patch um, that's connected to a wire, and the wire goes to a separate box. That patch is put on the new breast, and it monitors the blood flow every minute. 
Um, so the changes that are picked up by the T-STAT are far more sensitive to the clinical exam, the naked eye. So the T-STAT is a very helpful early warning system. I particularly like it because um, there's a very handy app. Um, I can check the numbers on my phone randomly whenever I want. Obviously, the patient doesn't know. I can't see the patient. I can't see her room. I can't hear her talking. Uh, all I see is the numbers from her monitor online, and it's live. Mm -hmm. And then I can also set an alarm by I get a text notification if the numbers go outside of parameters that I set. So it's really, really very helpful. Um, there are other companies that use uh, similar tech. Uh, we prefer the T-STAT. Um, we've tried other companies too, and that, that's the one that we've kind of been using now for years and we like it very much. <clears throat> Reason being that it doesn't just measure the oxygen level. You know, when you go into the hospital and they check your pulse ox, they put a little monitor Yep. fingertip and that yep. gives you an oxygen saturation mm -hmm. the t-stat gives you something similar mm -hmm. um to that but in addition it gives you another number which is the hemoglobin concentration which not all perfusion devices give you so it's the added benefit of this particular device in our opinion and when these flaps develop a problem, the most common problem is actually not blood going in. So you, we connect an artery that takes blood in, mm -hmm. new breast to the tissue, into the flap. And we also connect a vein and the vein, sometimes two veins, the veins take the blood out. So the tissue can develop a problem if either one of those goes down, if blood stops going in, obviously the tissue can die, but blood can still go in, but then there can be a blockage with it coming out. So then the tissue just gets engorged and basically it suffocates itself. So, I, don't want to, I don't want to uh, interrupt you, but this chart you were talking about, do you want me to share the slides now? Yeah, sure. Great. Go for okay. it. Okay. Yeah, the slides are what you were talking about. So let's pull those up. And see what you're talking about here. Let me put this on. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, here you go. Yeah. So, talk about so, um, <clears throat> so these are the graphs that you know, I see on my phone. And on the left, the, sat the percentage saturation, that's the oxygen. So that's really the blood going in. And you can see the squiggly line. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, it's fairly stable. It took a little dip at about 4 a.m. And that, you know, sometimes when you open up the bra and move the breast around a little bit, that can temporarily kind of change the blood little bit because you're putting pressure on the breast in different places mm -hmm. and then you see the squiggly line came back up to you know 70 odd you know almost 75 percent yeah and then if you look at the right graph during that time that same time period 4 a.m before it goes up so you know it, it kind of it's going squiggly line up down up down up down and then at about um shortly before 5 a.m it spiked up mm. and that was a very that wasn't just a little a little kind of squiggly increase that was a major increase and it stayed there so that was at 4 50 a.m mm. so that graph shows the hemoglobin concentration which is this kind of value added feature that the t-stat monitor has which is what what we really like and you see that at 4.50 a.m., when the hemoglobin concentration went up and stayed high, mm -hmm. when you go back to the saturation graph on the left at that same time point, you see that it really hadn't dropped yet. It had mm -hmm. kind of come down a little bit, yeah. but it was still within the realms of normal relative to what the line had been doing, yeah. you know, a few hours before. 
So if you'd just gone on the oxygen saturation, you know, nothing really, there's no, there's nothing to be alarmed about. Yeah. Now I was called at 4.50 AM by our super savvy breast nurse because she realized, and, and she's got the training and she specializes in what we do. And we have a core group of nurses. Um, that's why we don't have anyone taking care of our patients. They're specialized breast nurses that have been trained. But she realized that this increase in oxygen hemoglobin on the right was a significant change for this specific breast. So she called me and the conversation went like this. It went, well, Dr. C, so Mrs. So-and-so's hemoglobin concentration just spiked. Um, breast still looks okay. You know, maybe it's a little bit more swollen, but I really don't think it's anything significant, but I'm calling you because of the hemoglobin concentration. I said, okay, well, let's uh, send her down. We're taking her to surgery because in our experience, when we see a significant rapid increase like this, this mm -hmm. usually means that there's a blockage in the vein. So blood is going in, but not coming out of the tissue. And if you leave this long enough, um, the engorged flap becomes purple. It becomes bigger, it becomes swollen, it becomes full of blood and it changes color. But you yeah. wanna catch this as early as possible to give you the best chance you have of fixing the problem and keeping the tissue healthy. Because if you sit on this too long, the tissue dies and the patient loses her reconstruction. So I think I sent you a second pic, a second slide. If we can move up. So here we go. So this is at 5.52 AM. So this is an hour after the phone call. Yeah. And that's how long it took for us to get the lady down from, the, from, the, from her room to, into the OR and this was just before prepped her chest. So that's actually a pretty quick turnaround for most places from mm -hmm. your room into the OR and prepping the patient an hour. That's not bad, that's pretty quick. Yeah. And you can see that over the space of that hour, now the flap looks like it can look when the vein uh, is, is blocked, um, but We've gained an hour now because I'm not getting the phone call for the first time during an hourly checkup. And that flap has had a blocked vein for an hour before the nurse picks up on the fact that it's changed color on, her, on the visual exam. So that T-STAT monitor helped us get this lady back to the OR as soon as possible. And now... You, and then you see the flap on the right, the picture on the right, that's at the end of the surgery after the new monitor is on and we fix the problem, we open things back up. She did indeed have a clot in the vein. The vein was kinked and it, it caused a clot and caused obstruction and we removed the clot and we sewed things back up, reconnected the vein and blood was flowing again and she has a healthy flap. And so, um, would the nurses have picked up on a purple flap? Absolutely, they would have. But the T-STAT basically got this lady back to the OR an hour earlier, potentially, than, than she would have gone to the OR. And so this early warning device really is, is, is super helpful. So that's why we, that's why we use it. Uh, like I mentioned, there are other perfusion monitors out there, but that's the one that we prefer uh, because of the added value of the hemoglobin concentration. So, um, great product. So, there are, you know, and, and patients should talk about, you know, how how is my how is my tissue monitored? How am I monitored after the surgery? You know, who takes care of me? Do I? Some places uh, still send patients to the ICU. Some patients have specialized breast units. Mm -hmm. There are internal devices as well as these external uh, perfusion devices. So I don't want patients to think this is the only way to monitor a breast, far from it. It's just the way that we've found works 
in our practice. But as long as the conversation is had and expectations are set, um, you know, that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah, well, that that's the message that I wanted to get across today, because, you know, it's always important. I tell patients, one of the things they always say, well, how do I know, you know, uh, what is a good microsurgeon? Well, you know, one of the questions I ask is their success rate, but I'm glad we had this conversation because in the best of hands, okay, I think you're the best of hands. You did my reconstruction, um, but there's lots of wonderful microsurgeons. The point I'm making is in the best of hands, there can be these kinks, there can be these blockages uh, that come up. And so the flap success rate is not only, I think Dr. C, I guess in my mind as a patient, not only how they are sewn together, but also tools that surgeons use and that optimize the success of a flap. So, yeah, that's absolutely right. Because uh, that, I mean, that's spot on, right? There are, there are plenty of excellent technicians, you know, microsurgeons. Mm -hmm. um, none of us have a 0% failure rate just yeah. by nature, by nature of what we do. And, you know, there are intangibles that sometimes we just can't control for. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a single institution on the planet that has a 100% flap survival rate. Yeah. There's always, unfortunately, a loss. But when you're dealing with such expertise, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, mm -hmm. uh, which practice you're in. All of us, all of my colleagues that, that do what we do at PRMA, we're all, we're all focused on incremental improvement because when your flap loss rate is less than 1%, you know, now you're looking at tiny things that you can potentially do better to stack, stack the deck in your favor and in the patient's favor. And it's, you know, a ton, you know, a, a lot of incremental improvements mm -hmm. can lead to a significant move of the needle, right? Yes. And so that, and that's what our practice is about and, and other, you know, our colleagues around the world that do what we do. That's where we are now, you know. So these monitors, that's, this is the difference between, you know, between losing you know, one or two flaps or, or, or not. Right? And so when you're dealing with such low numbers of losses, mm -hmm. it's the incremental improvement that statistically may not make a difference because you're doing thousands of flaps and you're only losing such a small number. I mean, you've got to do 50,000 before you pick up a statistical significance, right? In terms of the mathematics. Um, if you're doing, you know, you, you do 5,000 flaps, if you lose five or you lose 10, that's still a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. But for those five patients that you saved, that's a life-changing event, right? Oh. So, so it's incremental changes that we all look at. Um, and that's what we do in our, you know, our doctor's meetings, our, you know, internal QI meetings. This is the kind of stuff that we talk about, you know, it's, and, and there are, we just hired eight surgeon. He'll be starting with us at PRMA in January. Um, and we, thank you. And, and we talk and we're very excited. He's, he's going to be amazing. Um, and, but we talk about, you know, we're constantly learning from each other and little things, just tiny little incremental changes that in the big picture, can add up and, and make a difference. And well, T is one of them. As a patient, my little thing today, if you're watching and you're thinking about breast reconstruction, ask your surgeon how they monitor the flap. It will sink into you the importance of it. And, and I do have patients ask about it. So Dr. C, thanks for your time today. Always, thank you. 
Yeah, really good to see you again. And if you have any questions or comments about this video or any other topics you would like us to cover, let us know and stay safe. And thanks for joining today.